Good evening, everybody. My name is Jacob Fleming. I'm the SIR RFS Communications Co-Chair. Uh, and tonight, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome uh, uh, three excellent uh, visionaries in musculoskeletal radiology, and as well, uh, my partner in playing this event, Priyam Chowdhury uh, from the Clinical Education Committee. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Priyam to uh, get our presentation started. Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to our first session of the introductory to MSKIR webinar series organized by the Clinical Education Committee and Pain and MSK Service Line of SIR RFS, Society of Interventional Radiology, Resident Fellow and Student Section. I'm Priyam Chaudhary, member of Clinical Education Committee of the SIR RFS and a research fellow at Mayo Clinic Radiology. It's my pleasure to be co-hosting this session with Dr. Jacob Fleming, PGY4 of Radiology at UTSW, and the co-chair of Communications at SIR RFS. We are honored and privileged to have extremely distinguished leaders in the field of MSK join us as panelists for this session, and we want to thank them for the time. First, we have Dr. Hilary Garner, Assistant Professor in the Department of Radiology at Mayo Clinic. Florida. Fun fact about her, she loves soccer and plays soccer at a local team in Florida. Then we have Dr. Matthew Kalstrom, Professor and Chair of Radiology at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Fun fact about him, he likes to road, road bike and build furniture, mission and art and craft style. Then we have Dr. Douglas Peel, founder of the Spine Fracture Institute and Chief of Radiology Service at Clinical Radiology of Oklahoma. Fun fact about him, he was an extra on the TV show Homicide when he was a resident. We will begin this session with Jacob giving us a brief overview of what MSKIR is and why it's important, the breadth of practice the field encompasses, and the different training pathways to become a well-trained MSK interventionalist followed by some great cases by our panelists demonstrating how to maneuver such cases successfully. At the end of case discussion by our panelists, we have a question and answer session from our audience. Please feel free to drop any questions that you may have during this session and we'll try to answer them, as many of them as possible. I want to thank all of our audience for tuning in this evening and we sincerely hope you enjoy this session. With that, without any further delay, I hand it over to Jacob. Please take it away. You're muted, Jacob. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and for that lovely introduction. Um, so I'll try to be brief in talking a little bit about the basics of MSK IR and um, sort of training pathways. And we'll touch more on this later in uh, later sessions. Uh, but so generally, what is MSKIR? It's, it's really an approach. It's not a single specialty or subspecialty. And you'll see overlap with a lot of the techniques we're gonna talk about with different specialties from uh, physical medicine to neurosurgery or orthopedic surgery. But in general, what we're talking about tonight is the use of minimally invasive image-guided procedures for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes, and specifically involving the musculoskeletal system. So like all branches of interventional radiology, this is based on sound principles of anatomy, imaging expertise, uh, as well biomechanics, in addition to pharmacology and complication prevention. And we use multiple imaging modalities, so procedurally, uh, use of fluoroscopy, CT, and ultrasound, and uh, evaluation of patients for many of these procedures uh, requires expertise with MRI, of course, uh, plain film radiography, and even uh, DEXA. And so the goal of MSKIR is to provide minimally invasive treatment to maximize patient outcomes and minimize risks. Uh, that probably sounds pretty familiar uh, if you're familiar with IR at all. So starting from that goal, why do we want to do MSKIR? Uh, a big draw is a huge potential to impact patient quality of life and outcomes. Uh, these procedures are often fast and effective and have a recovery. So you, both you can see the benefit for your patients and they can feel them uh, quite quickly. And because of these quick results, it lends itself to clinical hypothesis testing. So especially when it comes to 
uh, chronic pain or even acute pain. And you have to kind of put on your detective that hat and think of the anatomic factors that may be contributing, uh, causing pain. And this, this goes for degenerative and oncologic uh, setting as well. So a lot of what draws people to IR is that we do stuff that no one else can, at least until they learn to do it after we've perfected it. So uh, one of the things that's exciting about MSKIR is we do things that are otherwise impossible. And vertebral augmentation kind of uh, being the uh, uh, gold standard for this in terms of doing something that otherwise would require a huge surgery and making it an outpatient procedure with almost instantaneous recovery. And now applying that to uh, some of the example, uh, some of the work that uh, people, Dr. Kallstrom are working on, bringing those principles uh, outside of the final system as well. And uh, most importantly, there's lots of advancement at a very fast pace. So if you're interested in new things, new technology, and having a big impact on patients, this is a great field to think about. And let's talk about the breadth of practice. Uh, just kind of arbitrarily, we can divide uh, MSKIR up into oncologic and sort of non-oncologic practice. Uh, and I've, I've further divided that into sort of sports medicine and then degenerative disease. The important thing to realize is that these are not mutually exclusive categories. So things spill over from one to another. And the more you can think from a global approach of how do I use the tools in my armamentarium to handle this problem, uh, that is where uh, new advancements are, are made. And so when we talk about oncologic techniques, uh, ablation is... Uh, excellent modality for spinal and extraspinal lesions, both benign uh, and malignant, especially metastatic. And so uh, a lot of possibilities from a palliative oncologic approach uh, to ablate both for local control and pain control. Embolization can also be used as an adjunct. And then to compensate for the lack of bone integrity from lytic lesions and ablation, Cementoplasty is uh, just an extremely powerful tool. There's a lot of great things happening with different kinds of bone cement and different kinds of implant augmentation. And uh, as both Dr. Beale and Dr. Kylestrom will probably show this evening, uh, percutaneous fixation for complex pelvic lesions uh, and as well uh, related to uh, SI joint dysfunction. Uh, these are all things that are possible for uh, interventional radiologists to do because of our uh, visual spatial skills and knowledge of anatomy. And of course, uh, biopsies are bread and butter for radiologists. Uh, we provide the best and most safest biopsies uh, for anybody. And then a lot of cancer-related pain can cause visceral pain, for example, associated with the celiac plexus. So we can use uh, CT and ultrasound guided targeted nerve or plexus blocks, and then even neuro neurolysis with both chemicals or with cryoablation. So most of those therapies are things that no other specialty is really doing. You're not gonna hear about interventional pain specialists doing complex ablation and cementoplasty for these lesions. And so this is a great potential to do something for patients who otherwise really have no option. And I, uh, I personally see that as an area where interventional radiologists are going to provide a lot of value. Uh, and then if we kind of go away from the oncologic side, in terms of sports medicine, which obviously has some overlap with the de degenerative stuff I'll show on the next page, uh, joint and epidural steroid injections are bread and butter. And uh, there's a lot of cool things happening with orthobiologics, injectables, and implantables. Disc interventions are becoming more uh, possible and powerful than ever. Also, ultrasound guided uh, tendon interventions, like for uh, rotator cuff calcific tendinosis. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time reading all the stuff for degenerative disease, but suffice to say, as you'll see in Dr. Beale's presentation, there's just a lot of cool stuff coming out that's making uh, minimally invasive therapy really the go to for a lot of uh, problems that were previously thought to be surgical or for patients, again, who otherwise have no option. So this is really just a small slice of the different kind of things that can be encompassed in musculoskeletal IR. As for training, as the slide will show you here, there's really no one way to do it. Uh, everyone on this panel this evening had kind of a different experience 
And because of that, their practice has uh, different flavors. And so there's more than one way to skin a cat. I'm not going to jump down the rabbit hole of doing this, but as far as a radiology approach goes, um, you kind of have to think about the um, fellowship equivalent education. And so uh, kind of including the IR integrated residency as the equivalent of going through DR and then IR fellowship, um, which we now call the independent residency. Kind of the three main ways you can get to that through radiology would be an IR fellowship where you're going to get exposure to some of these musculoskeletal techniques or a neuroradiology or MSK radiology fellowship that similarly are procedurally heavy. So uh, this varies on a case by case basis, as I'll talk about in a second. And then uh, there is the option also of an interventional pain fellowship. And so these are fellowships that typically take graduates from PMNR or anesthesia programs, but other programs as well. And it has been done that, uh, you know, people have gone from radiology into interventional pain fellowships. However, if you go that route, you'll just have to keep in mind that each of these kind of has upsides and downsides, and each of them is going to inform the way you practice uh, based on your training. And so if you kind of want your practice to be a certain way, if you, if you want to focus just on uh, chronic and acute pain patients, interventional pain fellowship might be good for you. If you want to do complex oncologic interventions and you also want to do endovascular procedures, then probably something involving formal IR training might be for you. And so if you think about this too long, you're going to be kind of seeing the absurdity of it. So uh, at some point, we are planning to have a dedicated session on this with some panelists to talk about their experiences. One thing that I just want to say that I um, kind of brought up a moment ago is that when it comes to training, uh, not all programs are created equal. I think people are generally aware of this when it comes to residency programs, but especially when it comes to musculoskeletal IR. This is a pretty niche practice. And so, um, you know, one, one program may say, yeah, we're very procedural heavy, but if all those procedures are bone marrow biopsies, that's not really kind of exposing to the full potential of musculoskeletal interventional radiology. And a lot of uh, interventional radiology training programs are not going to get a lot of direct exposure to this. So this is all just to kind of say, do your homework, talk to people, find out about what different programs are doing. And if you're interested in them, uh, reach out. Uh, my experience has been that people are very receptive to uh, interested students or residents reaching out about uh, what their program is doing. Uh, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Priyam and she will introduce uh, our faculty to present their cases. Okay, first up we have Dr. Garder. She's the assistant professor of radiology at Mayo Clinic, Florida, Jacksonville. Dr. Garner, can you please share your slides? Absolutely. I think actually you have to, um, okay, yeah, show my screen. And let's see. Do you guys see my slides? Yes, we do. Okay, great. It just went away. Just went away? Let's see here. How about now? Perfect. Okay. All right. So um, thank you for the kind introduction, Priyam. I'll be uh, talking about diagnostic approach to musculoskeletal tumors since my colleagues, Dr. Kalstrom and Dr. Beal, will be talking more on the interventional side of thing, things. Um, as Jacob mentioned, um, every fellowship, every residency program is a little bit different in the experience that you'll have. At our fellowship, musculoskeletal ship, musculoskeletal fellowship program in Florida. We do do um, all of our musculoskeletal interventions within the musculoskeletal department. So we do cryoablation, radiofrequency ablation, um, obviously all of our biopsies and joint injections, but not nearly to the extent that I think Dr. Beal um, does with, uh, with the spinal procedures um, that he'll discuss later. Um, but because they're going to do the interventional side of things, I'm going to um, focus much more on the um, diagnostic side of things and specifically with musculoskeletal tumors. So I have no disclosures. 
Um, our learning objectives will be to discuss the most common imaging modalities used for diagnosis of MSK tumors. And because this audience is interested in MSK interventional procedures, and because I just have about 15 minutes or so, I'll also specifically review the multimodality imaging features of two MSK tumors that can be treated percutaneously by either an MSK or an interventional radiologist under image guidance. So when discussing imaging modalities and MSK tumor evaluation, Radiographs are where we always want to start. Radiographs are the most appropriate initial exam for imaging diagnosis when there is a clinical suspicion for not only bone tumors, but also soft tissue tumors. For bone tumors, the patient age, the lesion location, and the radiographic appearance can narrow the differential diagnosis to just one or two possibilities in most cases. As an example, let's look at this lesion here on the right. First, it's a skeletally immature patient Second, it's in the epiphysis. And third, it's lucent and geographic with a faint internal mineralization. So that combination of the general age, the epi um, epiphyseal location, and radiographic characteristics allow us to favor chondroblastoma over other possible diagnoses. For soft tissue tumors, you may think, well, why would I want radiographs? They're not great at delineating the soft tissues. So, but for the most part, MSK radiologists consider radiographs an essential part of the imaging evaluation for suspected soft tissue mass. And the reason for this is that several soft tissue tumors can show intramural mineralization, which may not be appreciated on our typical exam that you think about for soft tissue tumor, which is MRI. And knowing whether or not there's internal mineralization can greatly assist with narrowing that differential diagnosis. To illustrate this point, let's look at this case on the right. We have an axial post-contrast image of the hand where we see this very infiltrative, avidly enhancing soft tissue mass that seems to be growing every which way. And the outside interpretation of this MRI was, quote unquote, suspicious for soft tissue sarcoma. This patient was referred to our oncology team, terrified that her hand was gonna need to be amputated for this sarcoma. And so the team calls us to get our opinion. And the first thing um, we as musculoskeletal radiologists ask is, well, do we have a comparison radiograph of that hand? And in this case, um, there was no radiograph obtained. So we recommended obtaining one and going from there. A radiograph was taken and voila, um, we see these small rounded lamellar calcifications in the soft tissues within the region of the mass seen on MRI. And these are what flebolists look like. And with these radiographs, we were actually able to more confidently diagnose the lesion on MRI as a venous malformation and avoid a very bloody biopsy. Other pieces of information that radiographs can provide are the overall density of the mass. Um, so for example, in a fatty con or a fat containing mass, they can be very low density compared to the um, surrounding soft tissues. Um, and also its relationship or effect on the underlying bone. And even when the radiographs are quote unquote normal, this is still a very helpful piece of information for interpreting the subsequent MRI. So anytime my colleagues and I open up an MRI of, for any reason in the musculoskeletal realm, the first thing we do is to look for that comparison radiograph. Well, ultrasound is another modality that's available to us, which in the MSK uh, tumor realm, we use most often in superficial soft tissue tumors to determine whether a palpable mass is either cystic or solid. The images on the right were obtained in two different patients, both of whom presented with palpable masses in their right knee. The top image shows an anechoic lesion, and when we see this along with no internal Doppler flow, which I'm, that image I'm not showing you, we can call it benign and just usually let it go. The bottom image shows a hypoechoic lesion, but um, still solid and not cystic in nature. And these are typically indeterminate by ultrasound and further imaging with MRI is often recommended. As I mentioned, um, we interrogate any palpable soft tissue mass with Doppler to determine vascularity. And in that little solid mass, we see that it is quite hypervascular with a prominent feeding vessel that is indicated by the arrow. Of course, it went on to MRI for further characterization, and then biopsy was requested for definitive pathologic diagnosis. For soft tissue masses, our go-to modality for guidance is ultrasound. And in this bottom image, we can nicely see the thin hyperechoic needle spearing the center of the mass. And this turned out to be a benign glomus tumor. CT is another important modality that we have in our diagnostic imaging armamentarium. 
It can be particularly helpful for bone tumors in that it provides greater detail, particularly with the matrix characterization and also delineation of its relationship with the cortex. On this axial CT image to the right, we see an extremely and diffusely sclerotic mass that's seemingly perched on that posterior cortex of the distal femur. It has a dense osteoid matrix, and although the bulk of the mass is extracortical, there is a small portion that extends into that medullary cavity. And these features um, strongly favor a parosteal osteosarcoma other, uh, over other possible lesions. When there's a known primary non-osseous malignancy like breast cancer, prostate cancer, or even lung cancer, CT is able to detect metastatic bone lesions, and combining CT with PET imaging allows for even greater sensitivity and detection of osseous metastases, and here's an example of one. Uh, but Dr. Kalstrom is going to discuss more um, on CT-guided interventional therapies available for bone metastases, so I'm not going to go into any more detail on those. MRI, of course, is the imaging workhorse for tumor characterization and local staging. Local staging is where radiologists use MRI to determine the status of the structure surrounding the tumor. And for bone tumors, this means detecting skip lesions or physeal involvement, joint involvement, or even so, um, surrounding soft tissue involvement. And in these coronal T1, T2 fat saturated and post contrast MR images on the right, we see a very large, heterogeneous, aggressive looking tumor in the distal femoral diaphysis and metaphysis of a skeletally immature patient. The associated large soft tissue mass extending into the medial soft tissues is well delineated by MRI, which allows us to stage this as an extra compartmental spread, which has implications for surgical options. Furthermore, the MRI in this case demonstrated another very important detail on the skip lesion hugging that distal physis, and specifically that the tumor was actually crossing the physis here centrally into the epiphysis. And this epiphyseal involvement precludes the ability to perform limb salvage, leaving amputation as the one remaining surgical option with the intent to cure. For soft tissue tumors, the outstanding detail provided by MRI allows for detection of invasion of the deep fascia. It also allows us to determine whether it is growing along the fascia, invading other muscular compartments, or encasing nerves or vessels, all of which are seen in this axial MR image of an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma in the thigh. In addition to answering these essential questions, MRI can also be used for percutaneous treatment planning and in some instances, which we are gaining ground in, even treatment guidance. And I think Dr. Kalstrom will be discussing that a little bit further as well. Um, and I think in particular, he's gonna be discussing this special tumor here, which is an example of a um, desmoid tumor. Other things we use MRI for is um, in the assessment of treatment response and for surveillance purposes to detect possible recurrence. So now that I've briefly discussed the most common imaging modalities we use in the realm of MSK to diagnose musculoskeletal tumors, I'll now review the imaging findings of two MSK tumors that are amenable to percutaneous MSK interventional treatment. And of those on this list, the two that I'll focus on uh, for bone are osteoid osteomas and for soft tissue um, desmoid tumors. So regarding osteoid osteoma, it accounts for 10 to 15 percent of all benign bone tumors. It mostly affects young subjects, mainly between 5 and 25 years of age with a male predominance. However, it can affect people over the age of 40. The majority arise in the cortex of long bones, where the lesion is usually, usually diaphyseal or metadiaphyseal, but clinically, um, pain is almost always an associated symptom and is initially mild or inconstant, but may become more severe and persistent. Uh, typically, the pain is more intense at night and is relieved by nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, the duration of the pain before diagnosis varies from weeks to even years, with an average duration of 10 to 15 months um, before diagnosis. And this actually is even elongated more when it, um, the osteoid osteoma is intra-articular in location with an average delay of even up to two years or more before you know, the osteoid osteoma is finally recognized as being the cause. Um, and certainly in this case that we see here on the right, there was a delay in diagnosis, um, but this is a seven-year-old boy and um, unfortunately, we don't clearly see the discrete lesion, but instead we see this thick, smooth periosteal reaction along that medial aspect of the proximal left femoral diaphysis um, without cortical destruction. 
Um, due to that unique anatomy of that proximal femur, clear visualization of an osteoidosteomenitis on radiographs can be challenging, as it was in this case. Um, but when you don't clearly see uh, a discrete lesion, but instead see thick, smooth um, periosteal new bone formation um, along, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, when it arises in a less anatomically complex area, like the tibial shaft, like we see here, the nidus can be visible, as seen in this um, AP radiograph of a 21-year-old man. And when that nidus is visible on radiographs, it appears as a small, regular, um, spherical, or even elliptical radiolucent area that is usually less than about 10 millimeters. Very rarely, it's more than 15 to 20 mil millimeters. Um, and uh, just as we saw in that proximal femoral osteoidosteoma in that seven-year-old, we again see here thick, smooth periosteal reaction on the corresponding um, uh, lateral view, we, where we have it even more magnified. We see that uh, faint, rounded lucency with very thick, overlying um, periosteal reaction. Now, what about um, osteoidosteoma on CT? So let's go back to our seven-year-old with that proximal femoral osteoidosteoma. Although we couldn't see the nidus well on his radiographs, we actually see it beautifully here on CT. In fact, the nidus of an osteoidosteoma can almost always be identified on CT. About 50% of the time, um, a calcified central dot will be seen within that radiolucent nidus, which we call the bullseye appearance. And here I'm pointing it out to you on this example. Um, and also, another very characteristic CT feature of osteoidosteoma are these thin, linear, sometimes serpentine radiolucencies that connect um, the nidus with the periosteal um, surface. And these tunnels correspond to hypertrophic vascular channels and are known as the quote-unquote CT vessel sign or um, quote-unquote vascular groove sign. And they are detected in about 80% of cases on um, high-resolution CT, as we see here. in this um, distal tibial uh, osteoma in the 21-year-old. So unlike on CT, osteoidosteomas on MRI are a little bit more complicated. And I say this because the nidus cannot be detected on MRI in up to 35% of cases. Instead, what you see consistently on MRI is a very prominent reactive edema in the surrounding marrow and surrounding soft tissues. Unfortunately, reactive edema is nonspecific and can be seen with stress fractures or infection and even um, other certain tumors. So when you have nonspecific edema and no visible nidus, the diagnosis of osteoidosteoma may evade coming to the forefront of your mind. And so even when the nidus is visible, like in our 21-year-old with the distal tibial lesion seen here in this example, that prominent edema may overwhelm an interpreter's appreciation for the presence of that nidus. Um, so invisibility of the nidus can also depend on the quality of the MRI exam. In this particular case, the quality is a little suboptimal compared to current standards um, at many academic institutions. And compare that to this case, our, the seven-year-old with the proximal femoral osteoidosteoma, where the quality and resolution is significantly better and the nidus is more clearly seen. Um, when the nidus is visible on MRI, it demonstrates low to intermediate signal on T1. Variable T2 signal, which in this case, it's mildly hyperintense with the central black dot, which corresponds to that um, bullseye on CT. And there's also typically with these um, enhancement of that nidus, which in this particular case is overall pretty mild. Osteoidosteomas can be asymptomatic, and even when they are symptomatic, they can eventually burn out on their own, but this usually takes several years, and on average up to eight years before your symptoms will completely resolve. So a lot of times the symptoms are so significant and so bad that it affects the patient's quality of life and waiting to see if it will get better on its own is really just not a viable option. So fortunately, there's this excellent, highly effective, non-operative method of treating these lesions percutaneously, and that's with radiofrequency ablation. And radiofrequency ablation is actually now the gold standard for treating these lesions with a success rate approaching 100% and a very low complication rate. So really the ideal um, treatment method. And the image on the right was obtained during radiofrequency ablation of that osteoidosteoma in the seven-year-old in the proximal left femur. In our practice here at Mayo Clinic in Florida, radiofrequency ablation of osteoidosteomas is performed by our musculoskeletal radiology team. Um, 
And uh, actually the 21 year old that had the distal tibial osteoidosteoma, we're gonna do his next week. Um, but you know, it depends on the practice, which academic institution you're at, whether it's gonna be done by a musculoskeletal radiologist or an interventional radiologist. So it is um, highly variable, just like Jacob mentioned. Um, lastly, I'll briefly talk about the diagnosis of um, desmoid tumor. Desmoid tumor is a rare, benign, locally aggressive soft tissue tumor. Um, and they can be solitary or multiple and be sporadic or occur in association with familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome. Um, they typically affect patients between the ages of 15 and 16, or 60, with a peak incidence between the ages of 30 and 40. There's a two to three female to male predominance. And even though these tumors are benign, um, they can be quite morbid just because um, of their location and their infiltrative characteristics. Um, characteristics. They can cause pain and compressive symptoms and even um, some pretty severe cosmetic issues. Also, um, they because they're so infiltrative, they can be locally aggressive with a pretty significant recurrence rate that ranges between 20 and 68 percent, just depending on exactly where they are. And like I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, we like to perform radiographs for any soft tissue mass. Um, desmoid tumors are often not discernible on radiographs, but in some cases we can see a focal soft tissue mass or swelling that alters the normal contour of the overlying skin or the surrounding muscle. And in this particular case on the right, we see two soft tissue masses in the pretibial soft tissues, the lower causing a mild convexity along that skin surface. And since the pretibial soft tissue space is so tight, this desmoid is actually causing mass effect on the underlying bone, where we see a slight scalloping of the cortex and a mild periosteal reaction. And this underlying bone reaction without cortical destruction or medullary invasion tells, that the, tells us that this tumor has been here a long time and therefore is likely benign. So again, here's an example of radiographs giving us a lot of information, even though you know, they're kind of undervalued by most um, clinicians and physicians that are non-radiologists. So, um, also, as I stated earlier, for superficial soft tissue masses, we often do use ultrasound to kind of differentiate cystic from solid. Um, as with the radiographs, there's no unique sonographic feature of desmoid that allows us for a confident diagnosis. Um, it just presents sonographically as an indeterminate solid mass. It can have either regular or smooth margins. It can have variable echogenicity, variable vascularity, and it can also um, appear infiltrative. Um, when associated with familial adenomatous uh, polyposis, they are typically intra-abdominal and most often identified on CT as homogeneous soft tissue masses with ill-defined margins and mild homogeneous enhancement. Um, other tumors can have similar features, so the clinical history is really important in these cases to differentiate an intra-abdominal desmoid from like lymphoma or carcinoid or even gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So, um, MRI is the most accurate imaging modality for diagnosis of desmoid, although the T1 and T2 signal and the enhancement can be variable. The morphology of an extra abdominal desmoid is usually unique and identifiable um, with its infiltrative margins and fibrotic bands of very low T1 and T2 signal traversing the tumor. Here on the right, we see an elongated, irregular, infiltrative mass um, that is very dark in signal on T1 in the posterior thigh. And when you hone in a little bit more on that mass, you can see portions of the mass are iso-intense to muscle adjacent to a very hypo-intense portion. And those more iso-intense portions represent areas of increased cellularity, and the very dark or hypo-intense portion represents fibrosis or scar tissue. Similarly, on T2, we have a mildly hyperintense cellular portions that are adjacent to very um, hypointense fibrotic portions. And these are more cellular portions, of course, are the portions that demonstrate enhancement um, due to their increased vascularity. So the role of imaging for tumor evaluation is not only to characterize the tumor, but also define its extent and determine whether it is surgically resectable or if it would be better suited for other methods of treatment. For desmoid tumor, which again is benign, there are multiple treatment options. Just like with osteoid osteoma, these can sometimes spontaneously regress on their own. So observation for desmoid is usually attempted at least for a while, unless the tumor is extremely symptomatic or adversely affecting quality of life. 
Um, other options include surgery, radiation, even chemotherapy with serafinib, as well as something that radiologists can perform um, as, as an intervention, which is cryoablation. I know that Dr. Kalstrom will be speaking about cryoablation um, in desmoid tumor specifically, so he will provide greater detail on the procedure and outcomes. Um, the CT image on the right here shows an enormous desmoid tumor in the gluteal region extending down into the thigh that recently underwent a staged cryoablation procedure with 20 um, different probes, which we see uh, here in this um, intraprocedural CT image um, with that surrounding uh, ice ball. So in summary, the most common modalities used for diagnosis of MSK tumors are radiographs, ultrasound, CT, and uh, for bone mets, PET CT as well, and then um, finally MRI. Each one has significant value in its own right, um, and radiographs should not be undervalued at all. They're cheap, they're easy to get, and they're extremely helpful. Um, so always remember to look at those radiographs when you're interpreting um, an MRI, especially for tumor. Um, and lastly, there are two MSK tumors that you will see in your practice that actually do quite well with percutaneous interventional therapy, namely osteoidosteoma and desmoid tumor, which we will find out more now um, with Dr. Kalstrom. Thank you so much um, for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Garman. That was a great presentation. Um, next, we have Dr. Kalstrom. Ja Jacob, if you may share his slide. We have Dr. Kalstrom, Professor and Chair of Radiology at Mayo Clinic, Rochester. He's going to talk about the interventional aspect of this session. And uh, Thanks, are you able to the slides? Are, the, are you able to see your slides, Dr. Kalstrom? I see a white screen. Okay. Yeah. Just one moment here and we'll get this figured out. It's a little harder to talk to get when it looks like that. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, uh, thanks for including me. You know, Dr. Garner, great presentation. I think I, I learned a ton just in that bit there. So appreciate that. Um, these are my disclosures. I, if you guys will just advance as we go, go ahead. So we'll talk about a couple things. You know, MSK, um, IR, and I'll talk about ablation specifically. But one perspective, and I think Jacob, you know, highlighted this. Very little of this existed, you know, 15 years ago. So what you're seeing tonight is really things that have really evolved very quickly and it continues to evolve. And the, the examples I'll show, for example, in palliation of metastatic disease um, is born out of gaps in terms of patient care, if you'd advance. So we'll talk about complex disease, as Dr. Garner talked about. I'll show an example of desmoid tumor treatment. Some other complex things that we do in terms of um, treatment of patients that have metastatic disease, sterile metastases, one example in the spine, and how cementoplasty can actually help. And an emerging area for treatment is, is treating patients that have limited metastatic disease or oligometastatic disease. Uh, really great opportunity in terms of uh, extending patients' lives through the use of ablation. Go ahead. Just want you to see what a more modern interventional suite starts to look like now. We're starting to see um, suites that look more like an OR with a CT on rails so the patient doesn't move. You have fluoroscopy in the suite, ultrasound immediately adjacent to where you're working, and an ablation system if that's what's used if you advance. And in our center in Rochester, we actually have an MR, interventional MR suite immediately adjacent to where we do these procedures in our hybrid suite. So we can move patients between these modalities. And as Dr. Garner showed, sometimes MR is a much better modality for imaging what you're trying to do in terms of treatment of patients. Pretty complex environment. Um, and it's one that's also evolving very quickly. It's gonna be exciting to see what these suites look like over the course of the next several years. Please advance. So MSK ablation really started in about 2005. And it really started in the treatment of patients that had um, painful metastases. And it's because SBRT and other radiation therapies work for many patients, but unfortunately many have recurrent disease. And it often takes a long time for the disease uh, to be treated with these sorts of approaches. For example, 50% of patients won't have a pain response until over a month. And of those that do have 
a response, 20% will have recurrent pain within one to two months. So then they're left with the problem. And that's when we started to treat patients with ablation. Please advance. And so there have been a couple different trials that have been conducted. You can page through until you see the graph here. This is a patient that has a pheochromocytoma, actually quite painful in the shoulder. And you can see this was treated with cryoablation and ice ball encompassing that area. And you, I mean, you need to know your neural anatomy. The brachial plexus is right in front of that. But three months post, you can see that there's no further enhancement in this lesion. And it'll kind of, I'll talk about this a little bit at the end of the talk. Discover that you really could control metastatic disease in the MSK system. For this patient, though, the goal was to treat her pain. And she started out with seven over 10 pain. And over the course of weeks, uh, she got complete control of her pain. So she had no pain in that treated area, you know, over the course of the follow-up and it never did recur for her. Please advance. So we ran a couple trials and been running multiple centers. And this is what they typically look like depending on the modalities that you use. BPI is a brief pain inventory. Um, it's a measure of basically patient reported outcomes. And in general, patients started at seven over 10 and over time their pain dropped below two. Um, so it works very well for patients. Uh, please advance. So Dr. Garner promised that I'd show a desmoid tumor. So here's one in the interior abdominal wall of a 22-year-old woman. And you can see this is a, an enhancing um, phase of MR, very complex, quite often flame-shaped. And as Dr. Garner referenced, this is a pretty cellular desmoid. Um, pretty difficult to treat, eight by eight by three and a half centimeters. Please advance. Here's a coronal image. Um, so you have to think about how are you gonna treat this when you have adjacent bowel? Um, there's choices for this patient. And probably 10 years ago, surgery was the only option and she would have had a very complex reconstruction surgery. So go ahead and advance. And keep tabbing through here until you see all the selections on the right. So with this, and this is something that you'll find in treating patients that have complex disease, you have to know what options are available for patients to see whether what you offer is reasonable. Surgical excision would be offered in most centers. Um, it would be a very morbid surgery. Radiation therapy also has concerns with bowel. RF and microwave are both heat-based technologies, difficult to do safely. I'm gonna show how it works with cryoablation. Focused ultrasound is also offered in multiple centers, but also quite difficult with something that large. Probably the most common offering for this patient would have been observation to see whether or not you know, systemic therapy would help. And that's typically what we wait for to see whether or not there's progression. Please advance. So complex, this patient progressed and this, so the, this, the decision was to treat her with cryoablation. Um, here you can see multiple probes, both in the axial plane as well as the coronal. You can see eight probes are placed, basically spaced about one and a half centimeters apart and flat. So the question is, how do you avoid injuring the bowel, which is immediately adjacent to the anterior abdominal wall? Go ahead and advance. So we learned from our colleagues in surgery. Uh, so put a little artificial incitus. You can see a needle coming in from the upper right on this patient, generate a little bit of space, and then add CO2, just like would be done in the OR for laparoscopy. Please advance. If you get enough CO2, you can see that you have plenty of space between where you're going to treat in any adjacent tissues and CO2 is very safe. So now we can, we can be pretty aggressive in how we treat this patient uh, with this complex desmoid. So go ahead and advance. So they get complicated, I have to say. You'll see all sorts of devices and syringes and bags of CO2, um, but um, you have to stay pretty organized in terms of how you're approaching it, but this is a picture of what it looked like when this patient was treated. Next slide. So if you think about cryoablation, a um, couple of things that you have to appreciate is you can see ice on CT. Dr. Garner showed an example of that. But you have to get a little bit further um, coverage with ice to get, it, to get it to be lethal. You get to have to get to about minus 20 degrees centigrade. So that's a few millimeters inside the edge of the ice ball. Go ahead. And so this is what it looked like at the time of the procedure. Big ice ball surrounding the cryoprobes, complete coverage of this tumor. 
and you can see that we remain safe relative to the adjacent bowel. So take a very complex procedure or treatment and treat it safely. Go ahead. Here's how it looked on coronal imaging. So a lot of imaging happens while you do this. That's fine. So next, recurrent giant cell tumor. Quite often we're managing patients that have recurrent disease after surgery or other interventions. You hear a patient has recurrent giant cell in their proximal humerus. And if you look at um, options, what do you have to worry about if you try to treat this? Go ahead and advance. One is the biceps tendon. You have to know your anatomy so you don't cause an injury there or, or a blade into the biceps tendon. Go ahead. And the articular surface, you have to be respectful of that. It doesn't help to treat the tumor and cause them, cause them degenerative arthritis by injuring the cartilage or the bone um, at the joint. This is one reason why surgery was not a great option here because there was very little bone to work with. Go ahead. So treatment options, surgery, probably not great. Cryoablation and RF. I showed you an example of cryo. You certainly could, but to get a margin, you're going to ablate the residual uh, thin bit of bone that's there and would cause trouble. So we chose radiofrequency ablation. Go ahead and advance. So old systems, if you've heard about RF, were called monopolar systems, but bipolar systems are the latest ones that are used in MSK IR. So they, can, they basically can conduct between two electrodes, like is shown here, but the ones we use more commonly are when it's in a single electrode. Go ahead. Now you have basically two active tips and an insulator, and if you advance here, you can see that the, elect, the current flows between these two active tips, and you're able to generate heat in a very controlled way around the tip of the single probe system. Go ahead. So this one is a pretty unique, and we can put it in and we can actually measure the temperature of the proximal extent of this electrode and know what we're generating in, the, in these tissues, and you typically target over 50 degrees centigrade. So these are one placement of the, of the probe as it was done. Go ahead. But you can see on the photograph that this is an articulating bipolar RF system, and you can articulated to cover this lesion completely. And so this was treated with this bipolar RFD system, and we use these quite commonly. Go ahead. So talk about oligometastatic disease. Um, we're very familiar, please advance, with the treatment of disease that's in the liver and the lung and adrenal metastases, because we know that if these this sites of disease are resected surgically, their survival is improved. The question is, does it, is it effective to try and treat patients with, um, that have disease elsewhere in the body? And so we're starting to learn that it's probably effective in terms of survival. I'll show you examples. Go ahead. So I showed you that fetus chromocytoma that we treated. This is an example of a patient that has metastatic melanoma in an isolated location in his chest wall and a rib. And what we did was treat this uh, with cryoablation. Previous to starting to do this, we would be relatively you know, simple in our approach where we might just use one probe and go for palliation, but recognizing they only had one side of disease, we were pretty aggressive. Go ahead. We'd be a little more strategic now, but it took us six probes then to try and treat this. Um, but you can see a good ice ball encompassing that targeted lesion. And please advance. And eight months later, there was no disease in that treated area. And this uh, patient was a firefighter, actually went on, run, on to run a marathon after this treatment. So very effective um, in his making sure he had good quality of life. Go ahead. So the question is, does it help these patients? Uh, in this first report, we tried to follow how long it took before patients had additional metastatic disease. And the median survival to new metastatic disease was six months. Please advance. So is that helpful? The question is, does it extend their quality of life? And most of these patients lived four years with metastatic disease. So you can see the median survival for these patients was um, four years. So effective in the management of these patients. That's fine, keep going. I'll just keep up as you type, tab along. So this is a patient that had metastatic breast cancer. You can see that a mastectomy has been performed nine years after their initial diagnosis, but had a solitary focus of cancer that had been treated with definitive SBRT, but still had residual disease. 
you look on the coronal imaging, the pet, it's encompassing a lot of the sternum. And you can see the underlying destruction on the adjacent CT image. So what do you do? She could have a sternal resection, but that would be incredibly morbid. Go ahead. So you have to find ways to gain access. There's multiple different ways from drills to um, other types of um, battery-based systems. You go ahead and tab. So one's a striker drill, another one's an on-control system, and other, other bone biopsy type uh, access systems, which we use in various ways. So that's okay. If you can see on this next slide, or this next image, of basically a clip of the number of probes that were placed into the sternum using this sort of an approach, seven cryoprobes. And you can see the ice that was generated around the sternum. So pretty aggressive. You have to get a margin when you treat these patients. This patient went home the next day and had chest wall pain, was sneezing for two months, but no other therapy. Go ahead. And that patient had no recurrence after treatment. Here's one example in the spine. 67 year old with uh, prostate cancer and the inferior aspect of L5, go ahead. And so this was treated with a different bipolar RF system, kind of transpedicular approach, two electrodes with ablation of this. And this patient did extremely well in terms of uh, local control, go ahead. We looked at patients that had oligometastatic prostate cancer. You wouldn't think it would help to treat patients that have prostate to the bone, but patients did pretty well in terms of progression, 12 months for all patients. But if you looked at the group that had, were, had not had androgen deprivation therapy, 75% didn't have to have any therapy at two years. So really important for their uh, quality of life not to have that sort of treatment. Go ahead. So it's effective in terms of management. And finally, I'll show you a little augmentation case outside the spine. You can see on this clip that there's a metastatic lesion in the periacetabular region on the right with cortical disruption. Go ahead. This is treated with cryoblation to kill the tumor. And you can see that the ice is followed closely so it doesn't get into the femoral head. We follow that with using kyphoplasty balloons to re-demonstrate the space um, where this, the cement is going to go. And here's a couple examples of the sorts of balloons that you use. And then you get an excellent void filling with cement so that you can actually get a good column between the acetabular roof and the intact ilium above it. Go ahead. So in summary, really high level, there's lots of things that we can do and talk about all of these for all night if we'd like, but uh, ablation for palliation is really effective. There's also emerging evidence for treating oligometastatic disease in multiple different types of cancers. I showed you just a little bit of how we can go after complex disease with CO2, use articulate and bipolar RFA for complex lesions, treating sternal metastases, and how cement can actually help with fracture risk reduction in the pelvis. So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Castro, for that awesome presentation. Next, we have Dr. Beal, founder of the Spine Fracture Institute. And... Uh, Chief of Radiology Service at Clinical Radiology of Oklahoma, Dr. Beal. Thank you very much. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk uh, some about case-based and talk a little bit about practice-based stuff. As uh, Dr. Karlstrom said, a lot of this stuff is new. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the stuff that I'll show you tonight is uh, 10 years old or newer. And uh, as I started off with, um, our chairman in our department was uh, Elliot Cerrone, later became NIH head. He used to say, if you want to look at something, study something, or practice something, do something that's common. And back pain is tremendously common. It's very common, not only in terms of second greatest cause of uh, number of visits next to the common cold, uh, single biggest cause of disability worldwide, but it's 80% uh, lifetime incidence. So it's super common. This is from Becker Spine. Um, this is uh, core spine. The, the current practice ortho neuro is growing at a rate of about 3% per year. Interventional spine, 55%. Doubling time on that is about a year and four months. So incredibly uh, fast in growth. Uh, and the way that we do this, I call this the see and treat machine. So we diagnose it. We're expert at the diagnostic capability. Um, and we 
seen that um, a bunch of different times even this evening. And so we combine that with physical examination and then patient presentation. So imaging uh, is something we're very familiar with. Stories are something we're very familiar with. And we combine and we kind of learn in reverse to do physical examination and, and look at the imaging and correspond that with the stories. And then you can become quite good at physical examination. And, but the main the thing is the response to the injections. Um, you know, it's measured twice and cut, cut once. The response to the injection to isolate the pain generator is incredibly important. And so just garden variety stuff. This will be the oldest thing you'll see tonight. The caudal epidural approach, the interlaminar epidural approach, and all of this is epidural therapy, including the transforaminal approach for more localization of the pain generator, especially in patients with acute lumbar radiculopathy. I'm still a big believer in discography and provocative discography. I haven't done it in a decade because it's brutal. And But we commonly will see this combined with anesthetic discography to de decrease the number of false positives. This is a highly, highly effective. And then we do that because we have things that we can do to the disc. Regenerative therapy, we have, anti, uh, we have amino acid, anti-inflammatory molecules. We have uh, hydrogels, and so we have things that we need to be able to identify the disc as a source of pain. And this evening, I'm only going to talk about one item in this three-column list, and so we'll talk about things that are kind of near and dear to us, mainly the vertebral compression fracture, and this has undergone an evolution all the way from whenever we used to mix uh, cement with uh, high-tech things like a bowl and a spoon, all the way to uh, vertebral plastic kits, thought we were so fancy, all the way up through kyphoplasty, vertebral body stenting, and now implants. And so, as you know, vertebral plasty is just injecting bone cement into the vertebral body through a trocar, a needle. Balloon kyphoplasty is invented in the 90s, and this is inflates the balloon to create a path of least resistance and to reduce the fracture somewhat. And then mechanical vertebral augmentation implants. These are generally the next uh, evolution and rightfully so, because these things have been shown to be uh, better than the predicate, as I'll we'll talk about right now. So this is the spine jack, as I was showing you. It looks like a jack in the trunk of your car, uh, and it also is designed to reduce compression. So this is the SACOS trial, relatively small trial. It's designed as a non-inferiority trial comparing spine jack with balloon kyphoplasty. But despite the small number and the design of the trial, it was better in terms of better height reduction, greater pain relief, and most importantly, probably, is significantly less uh, adjacent level fractures. And so to put this into perspective, this is the only three superiority claims that exist, and these all came in a single trial. The only superiority claims in 37 years of vertebral augmentation when comparing something, a new device, to the predicate. And here's an example. You get profoundly good reduction in, in uh, vertebral compression. You're able to reduce it, restore it to good anatomic height. And this isn't an optimal example. This is about an average example, 60-year-old female primary osteoporosis. And even if we can reduce this, and this should be a lesson to all of us, so we get great reduction, and this is uh, a mild fracture at L3. The greatest amount of stress, if you measure the von Mises stresses across it, the greatest amount of stress happens in the middle column. People say, well, you shouldn't fill to the posterior wall, and that's completely incorrect. So that's, you could fill to it, just don't extravasate into the vertebral canal. There's the greatest stress is in the, the middle column. And here's what happens over time. If we have something with the greatest amount of stress, you can actually have failure at the posterior portion of the vertebral body, otherwise known as the middle column. So let me show you what's coming up. This is a screw-assisted internal fixation. This is something relatively new. And this is something that we typically do by going along a very flat trajectory, as is shown in the green, rather than 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock kyphoplasty trajectory. So this is just an example of vertebral body stent. This is available in Europe. This can be done, this technique can be done with pedicle uh, screws and spine jacks or any type of implant in front combined with screws in back. And you'll see some of this if you have not seen this already. So this is an example of screw-assisted internal fixation, mark transpedicular approach, the needle's going in, put it very flat trajectory, nine o'clock and three o'clock, not 10 o'clock and two o'clock, wire goes to the needle, drill goes through, mark on the other side, transpedicular approach, drill goes in, and once the drill is removed, the stents are placed, the stents are inflated, inflated more, 
inflated maximally and very nice reduction. And this is, uh, these are prophylactic levels, uh, which I commonly will do, and that's not a topic for tonight. But, and then the screws are inserted, and through the screws, the cement is injected, and here's the final product. Pretty good outcome. This is screw assisted internal fixation. So here we have all the fixation techniques all the way from a fracture. And this is the, the bar graphs here are measurements of the movement of the end plates. And so the end plates after a fracture, they move a lot. Have you ever seen a patient with spanning pedicle screws still hurt? The reason why it doesn't work that well for limiting uh, end plate movement. And then you have kyphoplasty screws, you have kyphoplasty construct, and, and all the way to the very end where it moves the least, this is a pedicle jack. A spine jack with a pedicle screw, but the combination of the least uh, spanning pedicle screws, the combination of the least invasive thing that provides the greatest amount of stability is screw assisted internal fixation. And so this is the area that we're heading, fixing the incident level fracture only. Kind of moving on to the posterior column, um, Jacob mentioned we'll talk about some of the pelvic stabilization, such as SI joint screws. Um, the example on the top is one I did um, last Tuesday, and these were all my cases. These are with uh, screw fixation. As you know, about 20% of the patients will have uh, problems with the SI joint pain related to that as a generator. It's incredibly debilitating, and importantly, non-surgical management, the so-called conservative care, doesn't work that well at all. And the uh, RF provides, works decently well, but provides exceedingly short-term evidence. And the graph there is from the Vanna Klocha study that I'll show you in a second. There's three major approaches to fusing the SI joint, posterior to anterior, posterior lateral, and lateral to medial. This is an example of posterior to anterior approach. This is uh, by and large placing bone dowels, although you can place screws here. Here's an example of what it looks like post, and this has gained popularity over the last decade quite a bit, and it works very well. 40 points of the VAS and approximately 60% Oswestry improvement in the last meta-analysis by Syed and Lee and Patterson. And this is the lateral approach. This is uh, probably my favorite approach, one I do the most. The bone corridors in S1 and S2, as you'll see there, uh, this is uh, exactly what, what you get whenever uh, you look at this, and this is staying in the bone corridors. You're able to put fairly large screws. This is 11 and a half by 60, 11 and a half by 50. Low demand patients get two screws. High demand patients get three screws. And this can be performed uh, even in patients with S1 screws or um, uh, ILAC bolts. Thing I've learned about ILAC bolts, all of that are designed to protect the SI joint screw, they don't do a great job at that. And the patients commonly will still have pain. S2 AI screws, not so much, much better, but uh, this can still be placed with existing hardware. And here's the data on pain and functional improvement. You can see the non-surgical management does basically nothing. SI joint denervation does eh, reasonably well, moderately well, but only for a short term. And SI joint fusion for the patients that have SI pain, uh, legitimate SI pain, such as seen in pelvic instability, anything, any fusion that crosses the 5-1, especially long segment fusions, these are very debilitated patients, very debilitated type thing that will be very well treated using SI joint fusion for the right patient. Finally, we're gonna end up on the middle of the column. This is basically talking about stenosis. And some of the new implants for stenosis, some of the fusion implants, uh, uh, stable link, the uh, Aurora Zip, um, some of the non-fusion uh, implants, such as Vertiflex Superion, these are one or two levels in patients with uh, six months or more of neurogenic intermittent claudication. We'll talk about these and some of the lateral-based implants. And see, the, the difference in these is that the X-Stop screw, which is an X-Stop is a non-fusion implant, Required about a seven or eight centimeter incision, and you know, I placed quite a few of these. And whenever the Vertiflex Superion with the smaller, uh, much smaller incision, expandable uh, implant came into vogue, this is very nice. And the lateral based implant, the Minuteman, and then the Q Fusion is not here quite yet, but I, I do quite a few Minuteman fusion uh, devices from the lateral based. And this is just an example of a before and after, so very little to no CSF around the nerve roots. That's how you can tell if somebody's symptomatic before and then afterwards really opened up. Here's a sagittal view of the same patient, a little bit of spondy, stenosis, 
uh, facet joint hypertrophic change, perfect candidate for these spacers, especially a fusion spacer. And the question is, well, how well do they do? Well, if you look out at, at five years, uh, this is 50 month data, people do pretty well. They have an 80% reduction in leg pain, a 65% reduction in back pain, and they continue to do fairly well over time. And this is an example of that reduction in leg and back pain over the course of five years. And I mentioned the Minuteman, I do quite a few of these. These are minimally invasive through a two and a half centimeter incision, placed lateral base. This is a fusion spacer, hydroxyapatite coated. It has bone graft uh, window in the middle of this post that, that will bone graft, as you can see there in the image on your lower left is equivalent to decompression for back pain, superior to laminectomy for leg pain, and superior in terms of blood loss, operative time, and any of the operative parameters. And so here's an example of the procedural steps. This is cutting of the skin only. It's all the way dilation. It's sized with the implant that goes in, and the extension plate is pulled into the fixed plate. I'll show you this little video here of how this is done. I do spinous process augmentation on these to uh, avoid spinous process fractures and symptom recurrence. And this is done by a series of dilations through a tube, a graduated tap for sizing these holes or the sizing indicators. And uh, once you get the appropriate size, the implant is placed and it's placed across the extensor plate is opened up and then uh, drawn approximately to the fixed plate. Voila. And there you go. That's a uh, placement of a minute man. Not quite that fast but close. Unfortunately, I don't have all the great toys that Dr. Karlstrom talked about. Uh, I've got a margin, you know, he has a CT and rails ultrasound uh, MRI. I've got a marginally competent C-arm and good karma and vibes for all of my uh, approaches. I'll end with this. This is a bunch of ways to fuse. Uh, they all end in lift, D lift, T lift, A lift, X lift for various approaches, O lift. This is a percutaneous approach, placement of the guide wire, followed by the dilator and the working channel. And through the working channel, we'll get uh, the rongeurs uh, rotating reamer. We get a balloon to make sure ensure the adequacy of discectomy. And we'll put in this little implant packed with bone graft. This is called a bull shark. It's kind of a cool name. And I back it up with facet screws and somebody with an L2 to L to S1 fusion. Uh, you know, no shocker, you have adjacent level breakdown at one, two. And so this is the target and this is the post after the placement of that very nice distraction backed up by, by facet screws. Here we have a pre post CT sagittal and the plain films. We have a post operative plain film showing the implant with the markers backed up with facet screws. Here we have a pre post pre post axial and coronal CT images. And this shows you exactly what you can do percutaneously. So percutaneous anterior and posterior fusion, uh, patient went home same day. So the bottom line of this is a lot of it is the see and treat paradigm. It's uh, localizing the pain generator by a combination of injections primarily. The diagnostic acumen is rendered by your expertise in diagnosis followed by your, your acquired uh, expertise in physical exam. And basically we're minifying everything. We, this is <clears throat> minimally invasive approach with maximum uh, possible outcomes. And additional investigation, of course, will be necessary to ensure adequacy, safety and efficacy, and in, uh, in optimal treatment of the minification of these previously maxified, maximized uh, treatment. And the see and treat algorithm is perfectly well suited for those of us in uh, radiology, MSK interve and interventional radiology in this this uh, MSK intervention is basically all I do. And as Jacob mentioned, there's a, a vast dramatic difference between MSK programs. Just look at one that's right for you because not uh, this, all of the programs don't do uh, as much diagnostic versus interventional. With that, I have to say thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Beal, for your great presentation. Jacob, was... would you like to take the questions? Yes, uh, we will go to questions. We have a few. Um, and uh, let's see, we'll get out of the uh, white screen of, of death uh, in just a moment here. Um, technical difficulties are to be expected, of course. Okay, is that showing now? Yes. 
Okay, yes. great. Um, so it looks like we have a few questions. I'll just I'll start off with uh, some of these, Priam. Um, so uh, I was I was kind of reading a very very insightful question here. Uh, it looks like it's directed to Dr. Kallstrom regarding the uh, multimodality suite. Uh, so a few related questions here. Um, uh, how many institutions have something like that, and how do you primarily use that kind of suite? You dictate the multimodality cases as one combined report, and do you have a standardized technique, or do you just kind of adjust on the fly as needed and use the modalities as it suits the, the approach? That's a good question, multi-layered. You know, first, to how many institutions, I would say not a lot, but I'd say it's a growing number. You know, most of the major interventional um, partners, you know, vendors are developing new hybrid suites, whether it be fluoro-based or fluoro plus CT. Those that combine MR, uh, less common. It really requires a lot of safety to manage that transition from CT space to MR. Um, so there's been a big program there. Interventional MR is growing. Um, really need to do it for the right reasons, I would say. It's very common in the neurosurgical world to have an interventional MR um, system. So that's that's one way to grow a practice. I say the probably one of the most common approaches is to do spine-based procedures. It's really, I think if Dr. Beal had what we have, he'd be doing even more complex things, you know, combining fluoro plus CT. It gives you a couple of different angles and opportunities for how you might treat disease, particularly metastatic disease. Um, if you're trying to get particular coverage of a tumor, um, CT helps a lot. Going into MR from CT, if you look at cryo um, in the spine, super hard to see ice in the middle of cortical bone, even if it's partially destroyed with tumor, but it's you know completely visible with MR. So you can do very complex spine intervention with uh, MR in terms of just following the ablation with uh, with cryo, for example. And there's cryo-compatible systems. Um, they're typically dictated as one case, so it has to be worth the effort to try and use all these different modalities. Um, when we schedule cases, we'll actually have an interventional, a, have an inter interventional MR case going on in parallel with an interventional CT fluoro case. So there's multiple cases going on at once. In our now three room suite um, system we have we do about 1500 cases a year through those rooms so there are a lot of cases are going on in parallel that that's awesome um i've definitely noticed that the um availability of interventional uh ct suites with combined angio and, and ct capabilities seems to be really increasing um which is very exciting there's a lot of good software kind of for guidance mm -hmm. uh, of uh, ablations and uh, screw fixation as well. The uh, Your setup with the MRI, like you said, I think is a bit more unique uh, and obviously mm -hmm. has some pretty awesome benefits as well. Um, let's see. So uh, I'm, I'm going to skip around some of these questions because uh, I see a few of them uh, are definitely uh, uh, would benefit from an answer from Dr. Beal. Uh, so Dr. Beal, I'm going to, uh, two of them are kind of related. Um, the first question is, uh, can MSK IR treat spondylolisthesis? And then uh, related to that is, uh, where can one get training for the Minuteman device? So spondy is really common. Uh, you know, four or five spinal anesthesis with uh, moderate or moderate to severe stenosis. I mean, that's just ubiquitously common. The answer is yes. I mean, we uh, the one that I showed you, the device I showed you can easily do that. We have facet screws. <clears throat> the other device, uh, in addition to the Minuteman, some of the fusion devices posteriorly uh, include things like stable link. Uh, you know, you can put in percutaneous pedicle screws. Those are very effective. Um, and the expandable interbody implants, I mean, you, you know, I've been trained in, uh, for XLIF, and then there's other ones, DLIF. But I think some of the more minimally invasive anterior implants are expandable. Uh, those are all candidates. Anytime you expand the implant, uh, whether it be mechanical or by, uh, by virtue of packing an implant with bone, 
I mean, it, it expands it and through ligamentotaxis, it will straighten up the spinal thesis and thereby cause indirect decompression. So these are these are things that don't have to. What I showed you with the the, the pet screws and the inner body implant, the inner body incision was uh, 11 millimeters, and the facet screw incision was was 10 millimeters. So there's three little one centimeter incisions like this, and the patient woke up and on par. I mean, we, we use a lot of uh, uh, anesthetic with uh, epinephrine, or you know you could use <clears throat> other other long acting anesthetics and on par people feel better you know, after the surgery because you know they're able to stand and walk despite the intervention and so you know these are these are absolutely things that that can be done and training with a minute man all you have to do is just uh, uh shoot me an email i can set it up for you the trainings are done nationally and they're done regionally there's four national courses a year uh that you know i i teach most most of those and and then uh, regional courses and so you just reach out to me and i'll figure out where you are and, and how to get you set up with it and that that includes basically everything that you saw so minute man is made by spinal simplicity uh, vertiflex is made by um the vertiflex appearance made by boston scientific and so forth so most of these are industry sponsored training that you can get trained to do pretty much anything Excellent. Thank you for those answers. Um, Priam, are you able to see the list of questions? Yes. Um, do you want me to take the next one? Yeah. Okay. Next question is, can IR MSK treat spondylolisthesis? Okay, you took that. Okay. What is the time frame during which vertebroplasty is an option? Is there any way to treat a chronic compression fracture? So can I take that one? <clears throat> yes, please. So there is no timeline. You know, so it all boils down. If it hurts, treat it. If it doesn't hurt, don't treat it. So we saw Medicare this last time with their LCDs make acute fractures acceptable for treatment. Well, we've known that since uh, Bill Clark's vapor trial, Yang's uh, acute randomized control trial with vertebral plasty versus non-surgical and acute fractures. There's data that's not been published. Paul Lawley has a paper coming out called uh, Vertos 5 that's a sham controlled trial uh, to treating chronic fractures. And so this is, uh, there's lots of data on chronic fractures. Um, so the expert opinion uh, that was headed up from the UCLA RAND using appropriateness methodology basically says timeline is unimportant, patient symptoms and advancement of the fracture, the worsening of the radiographic advancement of the fracture second. So patient symptoms first, worsening of the fracture radiographically second. So focus on that and not the timeline because you know we, we have we, and we see this all the time. We have an air filled cleft or fluid filled cleft on CT and MRI respectively in a vertebral body. What's that called if it's six months out? Well, it's a hypotrophic or oligotrophic nonunion. And we see that in a femur, and so and we can recognize that because ostensibly the patient can't walk on it, and it's being brought to our attention. But we see this all the time, and people are like, ah, you know, it's more than six months old. It can't be fixed. It can't be repaired. And all of us know that that's completely untrue. So you, the, these are one of the ones that that get better the fastest and the the and have the most replete recovery. So this is something that just focus on patient symptoms number one anatomic appearance number two in disregard time if it hurts treat it if it doesn't hurt don't treat it thank you dr beal for that answer i think we can wrap up this session i hope everyone had a great time in this session we want to thank all our panelists and audience for joining us today if you're interested in more mskir cases uh, we have more sessions coming up in the near future so with that, thank you, everyone. Good to see everybody. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Great session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much to our All panelists right. for your time, and, and thank you for everyone for watching. Uh, this video should be up on YouTube in the next few days. Uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us on uh, Twitter and um, look forward to having additional sessions in the future. Uh, make sure to follow our Twitter and other social media accounts for details for when those will be coming up.
And so once again, thank you all. I hope you all have a good evening. Thanks, Jacob and Pram. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob, Pram. Great session. Yeah, Thanks, guys. Good to see you.